Hello everyone, this is Gamer Ranger coming at you one more time with another one of my Warcraft Rumble gameplay videos. I believe this would be number six or number seven. I don't know, but it'll be in the title, that's for sure. So, today, I actually do have the time and the effort to once again continue in the book The Dark Hours by Michael Conley. And so that's what I'll be doing for today or for tonight because it is 9.44 at night. So let's continue in the story of The Dark Hours by Michael Conley. Where did we leave off? We left off at chapter 6. And that's where we pick um, chapter 6. Ballard didn't get back to the station until almost 3 a.m. She went up the stairs, off the back hallway, and into the room shared by the gang and vice units. It was long and rectangular and usually empty because both units worked the streets. But now the room was crowded. Officers from both squads in uniform like Ballard sat behind desks and at work tables going down the length of the room. Most of them were not wearing masks. The large crowd could be explained in a number of ways. First, it was difficult to work vice and gangs in full uniform, as dictated by the department's tactical alert. This meant the alert, which was supposed to put as many officers on the street as possible during the New Year celebration, was having the opposite effect. It could also mean that because it was beyond the witching hours at midnight to 2 a.m., Everyone had to return to the house on break. But Ballard knew that it could also be that this was the new LAPD officers stripped of the mandate of proactive enforcement and waiting to be reactive to hit the streets only when it was requested and required and only then doing the minimum so as not to indent engender a complaint or a controversy. To Ballard, much of the department had fallen into the pose of a citizen caught in the middle of a bank robbery, head down, eyes averted, adhering to the warning, everybody, nobody move and nobody gets hurt. She spotted Sergeant Rick Davenport at the end of one of the work tables and headed towards him. He looked up from a cell phone to see her coming, and a maskless smile of recognition creased his face. He was mid-forties and had been working gangs in the division for over a decade. Ballard, he said, I hear El Chapo got it tonight. Ballard stopped at the table. El Chapo, she asked. That's what we called Javier back in the day. Davenport said, when he was a gangster and using his Padre's place as a chop shop. But not anymore. He supposedly went straight after his wife started dropping kids. I was surprised I didn't see you out at the scene tonight. That why? That and other things. Just doing what the people want, which is staying off the street. It's pretty clear if they can't defund us, they want to DC us. Right, Cordo? Davenport looked for affirmation to a gang cop named Cordero. Right, Sergeant Cordero said. Ballard pulled out of the empty chair of Davenport's right side and sat down. She decided to get to the point. So, what can you tell me about Javier? She asked. Do you believe he went straight? Would Las Palmas even allow that? 
The word is that 12 or 15 years ago, he bought his way out, Davenport said. As far as we know, he's been clean and legit ever since. Or too smart for you. Davenport laughed. There's always that possibility. Well, do you still have a file on the guy? Shake cards, anything? Oh, we've got a file. It's probably a little dusty. Cordo, pull the file of Javier Rafa and bring it to the detective Ballard. Cordero got up and walked to the line of four drawer file cabinets that ran the length of one side of the room. That's how far this guy goes back, Davenport said. He's in the paper files. So definitely not active, Ballard pressed. Nope. And we would have known if he was. We follow some of the OGs. If they were meeting, we would have seen it. How far was Rafa before he dropped out? Not far. He was a soldier. We never made a case on the guy, but we knew he was chopping stolen cars for the team. How did you hear he bought this way out? Davenport shook his head like he couldn't remember. Just the great Brian, he said. I can't name the snitch offhand. It was a long time ago. But that was what was said, and as far as we could tell, it was accurate. How much does something like that cost? Ballard asked. Can't remember. It might be in the file. Cordero returned from the cabinets and handed a file to Davenport instead of Ballard. He, in turn, handled it, handed it to Ballard. Knock yourself out, he said. Can I take this? Ballard asked, as long as you bring it back, roger that. Ballard took the file, got up, and walked out. She had the feeling that several of the men were watching as she left the room. She was not popular in the office after a year of cajoling and then demanding intel and help in her investigations from people bent on doing as little as possible. She went down the stairs and into the detective bureau where she saw Lisa Muir at her desk. She was typing on her computer. You're back, Ballard said. No thanks to you, Moore said. You left me with those people and that kid cop. Rodriguez? He probably has five years on the job. He worked Rampart before coming here. Doesn't matter, he looks like a kid. Did you get anything good from the wife and daughters? No, but I'm writing it up. Where's this going anyway? I'm going to keep it for a bit. Send whatever you got to me. Not to the West Bureau? They're running all teams on a double murder, so I'll work this until they're ready to take it. And Dash is okay with that? I talked to him. It's not a problem. What do you have there? She pointed to the file Ballard was carrying. An old gang file on Rafa, Ballard said. Davenport said he hasn't been active in years that he bought his way out when he started a family. Ah, isn't that sweet, Moore said. The sarcasm was clear in her voice. Ballard had realized that Moore had lost her empathy. Working sex cases full time probably did that. Losing empathy for victim was a self-protective measure, but Ballard hoped it never helped happen to her. Police work could easily hollow you out, but she believed that losing one's empathy was losing one's soul. Send me your reports when you're ready to file, Ballard said. Will do, Moore said. And nothing on the midnight men, right? Not yet. Maybe they're lying low tonight. It's still early. On Thanksgiving, we didn't get the call out till dawn. Wonderful. Can't wait till dawn the sarcasm again. Ballard ignored it and grabbed an empty desk nearby. Because she worked the late show, she didn't have an assigned spot. She was expected to borrow a desk in the room whenever she needed one. She looked at a few of the knickknacks on one of the shelves in the cubicle where she sat and quickly realized it was the workstation of a daytime crimes against persons detective 
named Tom Newsom. He loved baseball, and there were several souvenir balls on little pedestals on the shelf. They had been assigned by Dodgers players past and present. The gem of the collective was in a small plastic tube to protect it. It wasn't signed by a player. Instead, the signature was from the man who called Dodgers games on radio and TV for more than 50 years. Vin Scully was revered as the voice of the city because he transcended baseball. Even Ballard knew who he was, and she thought that Newsom was risking the ball getting stolen, even in a police station. Opening the file in front of her, Ballard was greeted by a booking photo of Javier Rafa as a young man. He had died at age 38, and the photo was from a 2003 arrest for receiving stolen property. It said that Rafa had been pulled over in a 1977 Ford pickup truck with several used auto parts in the bed. One of these parts, a trans axle, still had the manufacturing serial number embossed on it, and it was traced to a Mercedes G wagon reported stolen in the Sanford Dando Valley the month before. According to the records in the file, Rafa's lawyer listed as Roger Mills, negotiated a disposition that got the 21-year-old Javier probation and community service in exchange for a guilty plea. The case was then expunged from Rafa's record when he completed probation and 120 hours of community service without issue. The file noted that his community service included painting over gang graffiti on freeway overpasses throughout the city. It was the one and only arrest record in the file, although there were several field interview cards paper clipped together there. These were all dated before the arrest and went back to when Rafa was 16 years old. Most of these came out of basic gang roust, patrol breaking up parties or Hollywood Boulevard cruise lines, officers taking down names and associates, tattoos and other descriptors to be fed into gang intel files and database. At the son of a body shop owner, Rafa was always driving classic and restored cars or low riders that were all also described on the shake cards. From early on in the cards, Rafa had the nickname El Chapo ascribed to him. It was an obvious riff on the moniker of one of the biggest cartel kingpins known as El Chapo, which meant shorty in Spanish. One note that caught Ballard's eye and was repeated on the four cards written and filed between 2000 and 2003 was the description of a tattoo on the right side of Rafa's neck. It depicted a white billiard ball with an orange stripe and the number 13, a reference to Las Palmas 13 and its association with and deference to La M. The prison gang, also known as the Mexican Mafia. The 13 was a reference to M, the 13th letter of the alphabet. Ballard thought about the discoloration she had seen on Rafa's neck. She realized it was a laser scarring from when he had the tattoo removed. There was a photocopy of an Intel report in the file dated October 25, 2006. That was a bullet point recounting of multiple nuggets of unsubstantiated bits of gossip and information from a confidential informant identified as LP3. Ballard assumed that the informant was a Las Palmas insider. 
She scanned through the separate entries and found the one about Rafa. Javier Rafa, El Chapo. Date of birth, 02-1482. Said to have paid Humberto Vieira 25,000 cash tribute for no string separation from the gang. Ballard had never heard of someone buying their way out of a gang. She had always known of the blood in, blood out, till death do us part rule of gang law. She picked up the desk phone. Newsom had taped a station phone directory to it. She called the extension next to GED and asked for a Sergeant Davenport. While she waited for him to come on the line, she picked up one of the baseballs off its pedestal and tried to make out the signature scribbled on it. She knew little about baseball or Dodgers players, past and present. To her, the first name of the signature looked like Mookie, but she thought that she had the, that wrong. Davenport came on the line. It's Ballard. Got a question. Go ahead. Umberto Vieira of Las Palma. Is he still around? Davenport chuckled. Depends on what you mean by around, he said. He's been up in Pelican Bay for at least eight, ten years, and he isn't coming back. Your case? Ballard asked. It was part of it, yeah. Got him on a couple of eight, one, sevens of white fence guys. We flipped the gate driver, and that was it for Humberto. Bye-bye on him. Okay. Anyone else I could talk to about Javier Rafa buying his way out of the gang? Mm, I don't think so. That goes pretty far back, as far as I can remember. I mean, mm, there are always the OGs around, but they're originally gangsters because they toe the line. But for the most part, these gangs turn over membership every 8 or 10 years. Nobody's going to talk to you about Rafa. What about the LP3? There was a purse before Davenport answered, and it was clear that earlier, when he had claimed not to remember the snitch, he was lying. What do you think you'll get out of her? So it, it's a woman. I didn't say that. What do you think you'll get out of him? I don't know. I'm looking for a reason somebody put a bullet in Javier Rafa's head. Well, LP3 is long gone. That's a dead end. You sure now? I'm sure. Thanks, Sergeant. I'll catch you later. Ballard put the phone in its cradle. It was clear to her from Davenport's cafe that let LP3 was a woman and possibly still active as an informant. Otherwise, he would not have been so clumsy in trying to cover up his slip of the tongue. Ballard didn't know what it meant in terms of her case, considering that Rafa had apparently separated from the gang 14 years earlier. But it was good to know that if the case turned toward the gang, that it the GED had an insider who could provide insight and information. What was that about? Moore asked. She was sitting across the aisle from Ballard. Gang enforcement, Ballard said. They don't want me talking to their Las Palmas CI figures, Moore said. Ballard wasn't sure what that meant but didn't respond. She knew Moore was one and done on the late show. Her involvement in the case would end when the sun came up and her shift was over. The tactical alert was ended and all officers returned to their normal schedules. Moore would be back on dayside, but Ballard would be left alone to work in the dark hours. It was exactly the way she wanted it. Okay, everyone, 
that will be it for me tonight. If anyone is still interested in continuing the reading of this book, I shall continue in my next Warcraft Rumble gameplay. But for the rest of the video, those fans of Warcraft Rumble can continue watching. And if you would like, you could leave a comment below in the video. And as always, please like, share, and subscribe subscribe <laughs> please like share and subscribe if you want that would be so very kind and generous of you and as always have a great night to all of you wonderful people who are already having a great night and those of you who aren't but anyways thank you so very much for coming to visit me nonetheless and to watch one of my many <laughs> to watch one of my many videos and as always volume change in three two one
shot! Nailed it!
Harvesting servos engaged.